We have saved uh, the best for the Sunday. We have a big day planned, including our next guest. I, so I do this a lot and I don't get like the fanboys, but I'm kind of fanboying that a little bit because bringing to the stage, we have an actor who is just absolutely extraordinary in everything he does. And I can't be more thrilled to welcome our next guest. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Giancarlo Esposito. My goodness. <laughs> wow. They are excited. They're happy to see you. I'm excited too. Can you tell? I can. So this is a Q&A, which means this is your opportunity to ask the questions you want to ask. Now, clearly, we're not going to talk spoilers of anything that might be in the pipe. You never know. I'll tell you everything. Do not <laughs> listen. <laughs> I'm in charge of making sure no spoilers get out. So, okay. Listen. <laughs> okay. So we have a microphone right over here. Uh, if you guys have questions, feel free to line up. You're not going to offend anybody if you get up and move over there. That's what that's for. Um, we will not get through all of your questions. I can just guarantee you that right now, and that's my fault. Again, I'm in charge of making sure we keep things rolling on time. Um, but we'll get through as many as we can, and if we don't get to your question, you'll be back at your table after this, signing autographs, answering those questions. I sure will. Absolutely. So they're kind of nerd out over all the cool stuff, like The Mandalorian, The Boys, uh, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul. And that's the great thing about these environments is we all are nerds about something. I'm kind of a theater nerd, and you've had an over five decade career on the theater. But there's one performance, there's one uh, that you did that I want to touch base with. It's been about 15 years ago that you were in a production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with James Earl Jones, Felicia Rashad, Terrence Howard. Tell us a little bit, that is that is so much talent, so much wisdom, so much institutional knowledge about the industry. Tell us a little bit about that experience for you and what you pulled out of that. Well, it was a great experience to be back on stage, especially at a time where Debbie Allen was directing an all African-American production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Um, it's really, really wonderful. We didn't change a word of the play and it, it's a great example that, that families uh, are families no matter what. Uh, wherever you place them, we all have a commonality and something that we share in connection to each other. Uh, it was wonderful to work with Terrence Howard because he, uh, is a, as a young actor, he would bang on my door in Manhattan Plaza when I lived on 43rd Street, and he, his mother lived in the next building, and he would come over at 12 at night and uh, want me to coach him on his lines for an audition the next day. So everything in, in life sometimes comes full circle, and um, really, really wonderful to do a Tennessee Williams play, um, you know, that in a contemporary time, uh, when African Americans were thought when the play was done as one thing, and then we took the play and we just replaced the characters with people who were brown skin, and still had a big question for us was whether we, or not we would have African American servants as well, and we did mm -hmm. uh, because it wasn't we weren't making the point of race; we were making the point of family connection and how um, how connected and how many things that we can share, no matter what culture we are from. So it was a great production to be a part of, and it was a really beautifully done. James Earl Jones, um, the connection for me is that I watched him early in my career as Darth Vader, um, and his voice uh, was just an amazing inspiration for me to do voice work, which I do a lot of, as some of you know now. And so it was great to work with him, and to see an actor who is so intellectually sound, crisp, intelligent, uh, and who had a dedication to his work was a great example for me. I had witnessed him earlier on in my career uh, as my brother did The Great White Hope on Broadway. Right. He played Jack Johnson, an African-American boxer. And so it was a great um, crowning moment for me to work with him. That's fantastic. I'm so glad you had that experience. That's awesome. Let's get to some questions because I know we're gonna have a ton of them. So step on up, give us your name, and ask your question. Hi, Mr. Esposito, my name is Chris. Um, first off, I think I speak for the rest of the crowd. Thank you very much for coming to Kansas City this weekend. It means a lot. Yeah, Kansas City! We love you. Okay, I'll just make it a quick question. Outside of being the awesome sauce Moff Gideon, 
Can you see yourself playing any of the other popular Imperial characters like Moff Tarkin, Jajera, Admiral Piet? We'll leave out Captain Eda. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to stick with Moff Gideon. Uh, only because I feel, I mean, I, I could see myself playing in this world another character, but I'm so committed to this one. I think this guy is really complicated, very different, uh, very full. I always believe, well, I believe now, after having played Moff Gideon, that, that somewhere inside of him there's a hero. And that hero wasn't, um, no one paid attention to that hero. And, and so this thought came to me that a, an anti-hero is a fallen hero. He's someone who may have had good intentions, and maybe that's, that's the reason my work as Moff is interesting, and no one would listen. And so then he tried to grab it, to lead people and force them. And, and then we have the dictator, the, the, the megalomaniac, the person who can't see beyond his own self as to what people need. And so this character has become so very important to me so that we can all see the light and dark of our own personalities. Cool, thank you. Long live the Empire. Long live the Empire! <laughs> Good question, thank you. Hi, what's your name? Hi, my name is Austin, and I'm a huge fan of Spike Lee and all of his films, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering if there was ever an opportunity for you to work with him again, because I love Do the Right Thing. Oh, I would really love to work with him again. In fact, this morning, um, um, my, my daughter sent me a clip from some press I was doing for Do the Right Thing, and she absolutely blew my mind. It's been so many years ago uh, where I'm speaking about the film, and uh, it, it was, it's on TikTok, so you can pick it up. Uh, and it really encompasses and imbibes everything that I'm about in regard to who we are as human beings. Um, for those of you who may not know my background, I have a very, very mixed background. I'm half Italian and half black. Um, I was uh, born in Copenhagen, Denmark, raised in Rome, Italy, and came to this country when I was five. So, it, you know, in the household, and this is, you know, the great point, the great question, bringing it back to Kevin Hot Tin Roof, in the household of my family in Europe, I observed um, my father, who was a very Italian man, and my mother, who was a very black woman. And I got a sense of the world through them. Now, they say that, that, you know, the mother, you know, teaches you things, how to do things, how to care for yourself, and the father is the hunter-gatherer, um, in traditional tribal elements who goes out, brings food, and brings the world back home. So I was blessed to have a mixed um, ancestry in growing up and mixed colors as well. With that is also a curse, is that the outside world sees you a certain way, right? They see, sometimes we see in America, and I learned this when I came here, white and black. And there's a whole spectrum in between that we ignore, but we have a judgment that we make on, on color, at least when I grew up. So it, it took me a long time to understand and have compassion for those who didn't see me as an equal human being. And I, I couldn't sit and tell this story to folks who disrespected me for, the, for a reason of the color of my skin, um, because it's just not the right situation. So I had to work on me to have more compassion and understanding for those people who didn't treat me the way I would like to be treated. And as I learned to love myself going through my journey for all that I am, then I started to understand that that was the first step to allowing other people to know who I really am. So, you know, many of you see me in many different incarnations. Um, and you, we use the word villain, people come up to me and say, you, you always play the villain. Um, yes, but um, I play villainous characters, and certainly there's some villainy that may live in me, possibly in my thought form, um, but there's also this hero that lives within me that challenges each and every one of you to honor that part of yourself. It's not just the glory of being a hero, it is the ultimate expansion of yourself to bring yourself to the best place that you can be. And that means you're bringing other people to the best place they can be. The hero and heroine's journey is to realize your earthly obligation to yourself and to each other. Beautiful, girl. absolutely. That's commendable, that's hard work to work on yourself first.
Hi, what's your name? Hi, my name is Matt. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I wanted to ask because in addition to being a great actor, you're also a phenomenal voice actor. I was curious how you adapt your acting style to a medium where you can only convey emotion through your voice. You know, I, I think about this because I was just in the studio with, um, and Seth Rogen was on the Zoom and uh, I, I went in a num numerous times for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And uh, by the third session, um, you know, I, I, I said, what's going on? You gotta ask them, do they want something different? Are they not happy? Or well, I mean, because I, I nail my voice work. I started my voice work um, a long time ago when I couldn't get my face on the screen because I was a mixed race and they wanted dark black kids to be on screen to represent all of us. And I kept saying, well, you know, there's many different variations of color. So I started with a guy named Ar um, Ray Fowler at RKO. And I developed um, a love and interest of being on the mic because you can only use this world that you have here. It's all you've got. And when I started, there was nothing on the screen, unlike Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where I'm looking at some footage of what I'm supposed to do. So all I could do was use this instrument inside me. It's very different and it uses your imagination. In our lives today, we don't need to have so much imagination because we can pick up the phone and look at ourselves. Oh, I look good. You don't need a mirror anymore because you can pick up the phone and, and be taken to another world. It is productive and destructive, right? So when we have a chance to use our imagination, close our eyes and see the whole world, then we start to, to cultivate this inner vision that I like to bring to all the characters I play, not only on screen, but also on the mic. Thank you, sir. You want to... Hi. Howdy. Uh, my name is Dakota. Uh, I would actually love it if you both chimed in on this question. Both of us? Both of you. I have nothing to add. <laughs> Go ahead. Heck yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Esposito, uh, two very different worlds, two very different characters. I'm curious who you think would win a chess match between Gustavo Fring and Moff Gideon. So interesting, are you speaking of an actual chess match? Like the game chess match. Yes, that's what I'm asking. Oh, yeah, yeah, as yeah, it was not, yeah. not a physical chess match. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that answer comes um, quickly to me. Um, uh, I would say it's Gustavo Fring. Um, and, and there's a reason why. Yeah, I'll clap for that. Yeah! <laughs> Gustavo. Moff! Gustavo. Moff! Uh, they're not the same. <laughs> they're, they're, you're asking the wrong guy. I don't know who I am today. <laughs> you have something I want. <laughs> never, never trust a drug addict. I say that because Gustavo thinks ahead of people. It's something I cultivated in doing the role. He thinks way down the street. Um, not that Moff doesn't think ahead, but Moff has a different world to deal with. Right? You gotta understand what room you're in, who you're speaking to, what world you're in. Step back a minute when you walk in the door and see what the vibration is. Feel it. Hear it. So Gustavo is in a world that he can control to a certain respect because he has tentacles out there, as does Moff, but he also is thinking ahead. He's able to listen, really pay attention, feel the energy, and then stop. Season four, Breaking Bad, coming into the parking lot. He walks to his car. He stops. He looks at it. It's there all by itself, seemingly untouched. He feels something in his gut, and he turns around and walks away. We have the power to feel our energy through and with each other. You think of somebody one day, and you think, I've got to call that person, and they call you. What do you think that is? That's your gut pulling energy into the world, out of the world, and pushing it back in. And the person that you've thought of comes into your consciousness. This is the power of who we are as human beings. We just stop using it and it gets rusty. 
brush it off because it is who you are. You're here. <laughs> you expected me to follow that. Good job. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, guys. Hi, come on up. Mistress Threads, and I have a question for you. Um, over the course of your career, um, I'm a costume designer, and I follow the credo of the clothing makes the character. So in the course of your career, my question is, um, is there any character where you felt like the costume really embodied the character or had a great impact on your portrayal of the character? Most certainly. I did a film with Tim Robbins called Bob Roberts many years ago, and um, you know, the, the character was taken from a reporter named Danny Casolaro. And there, the, the figure in Bob Roberts was a political figure who I was investigating. And the clothes had to be right. And I thought of what a writer and a reporter who's not mainstream would look like. Um, I heard stories about Dustin Hoffman early in his career where, you know, he would look for the right shoes. And that pair of shoes would inspire him in regard to the character. Um, I did the same thing with Bob Roberts because I had to walk and I had cerebral palsy. So I went to the Cerebral Palsy Institute and hung out with people who had it and started to feel their energy and figure out how my walk was going to be. And the certain boots that I, that I walked in and that were really important. Um, and I agree with you. Um, we, we, you know, my credo is, if you don't know, act as if. But if you do have an idea, let that flow from inside you. I've just worked with Milena Cononero, uh, who is um, won four Oscars. I work with her on Cotton Club and again on Megalopolis with Francis Ford Coppola. And she's very specific um, about the, the wardrobe and the costumes that she has made in Italy. Um, I just work with Guy Ritchie and, and finishing with him in London on a piece called The Gentleman. And, and Lulu, the costume designer there, made, I'm gonna play a very, very rich man. That's a very specific look in regard to tactile experience of material and what it looks like. It's the best in the world. Everything I'm wearing in that was made for me. Um, and I'm going back soon, I'm gonna get it all. <laughs> <laughs> so, but here's the flip side of the coin. I did Far Cry 6, where I'm standing, thank you, with, with a green suit and a, a power belt around my waist, a helmet on, with a bar in front, with a light in my face and three cameras, with every part of my body marked, with a sensor, in a room that's called a volume, which could shoot me in the room, and then the cameras are shooting all my facial expressions to be able to um, mimic them when they make the character. So there, I had no costume. So after years of having the experience that clothing really does put you in the space, of where you're supposed to be, says a lot about who you are, and you can see the way I'm dressed, is, you know, I, I feel like I'm honoring folks who are dressing up at a Comic-Con who are in wonder, enchantment, joy, excitement, and really have the ability to jump out of their own skin for a weekend. They can be the dream and yet be themselves. They can be empowered to be that character and the traits of that character that might bring them up and I say, take that with you. So there's a flip side to it. When you get strong enough to wear no clothes, wear no clothes. <laughs> I didn't know it was gonna be that kind of panel, all right. Right? It's an analogy for how we think and what we think of ourselves, right? Act as if until you can get strong enough not to need anyone else's validation but your own. And then you'll get up in the morning and you go, what? You know, I'm, uh, I'm feeling good today. Um, not because of my ego, but because I think something of myself. Because I'm carrying a dream, I'm carrying a hope, I'm carrying a vision, not just for today. What you do today determines your tomorrow. The vision that you carry for yourself, where you see yourself, it really works. And it's that simple. Two people in the last week have asked me, did you ever think, did you ever think, one today at my table, did you ever think when you did Trading Places in the background, Eddie Murphy, did you ever think that you'd be here where you are today? My gardener, when I went home for 24 hours to Al Albuquerque, said, did you ever think? My kids have to tell me, Papa, do you get it? All of our friends think you're crazy. I say, why? Because they say he doesn't even know who he is. But I actually do know who I am. Because they're her my kids' friends say, 
Your father is a pop culture icon. But you know what? That's all great. I tell myself when I get up every day that I'm a talented human being who wants to share all of my heart, all of the attributes I've been given, all the gifts that I've been blessed with to raise other people up as well as myself. And that's what I got and that's what I'm running with. My God, I'm ready to go. Let's go. <laughs> Come on up. That's our question to follow. Uh, yeah, good luck. <laughs> uh, my question is about with you and your colleague Lawrence Fishburne preserving films from black cinema. I wonder if you could talk about that and maybe recommend a movie that we should all watch. Oh my gosh, so years ago, that Lawrence Fishburne and I, and I just saw him recently, it's so nice you mentioned him, we had a lovely conversation on the sidewalk at four o'clock in the morning shooting Megalopolis in Atlanta. <laughs> um, Fish and I have a long, long history, and then we became friends years ago before, you know, he was Lawrence, back then he was Larry, and before I was Giancarlo Esposito. Uh, and we uh, stumbled across some films in Atlanta, Georgia, I did, through a guy named David McCord and another guy named David Moskowitz, who owned these films, that Ted Toddy was a cutter uh, for, I think it's Columbia. And he had all these movies that were, um, African-American movies from the 40s that were shot in nine days. So uh, we, we per I purchased them. I didn't have enough money, so I went to Larry's and said, you got some money. And because we, we were shooting school days there. And we bought these films. And I had two transferred from film to video in the hope that we would get them back on the market and sell them to people so people could be apprised of this history. Um, so. We had Lucky Ghost by Mantan Marlin, which would be a great, something great for you to watch. And we had a film by a woman named Nina Mae McKinney, who was an African-American star way before um, Lena Horne, or she was a film star. And, and, and her film was called Gun Mall. Or it had, most of these films had two titles that they're, they're distributed in different markets, or Gang Smashers. Um, and so, we, I, I put the films in storage in New York, and Larry had helped me buy them, and then after five years, I'm paying storage on these movies, and it was just like more than I paid for them. So we, I called Lawrence, and I said, Lawrence, you know, I don't want these films to die. These films were on nitrate. Nitrate's a material that films were made from. Most movie theaters, if you're a film buff, years ago had to have a window within the film booth um, so that the, 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 the engineer or operator, the guy changing reels or the woman changing reels could get out if there was a fire. Nitrate film is highly flammable. And so they moved away from nitrate over the years, but there were many fires in movie theaters. If that film went up, it was done. So all these films were on nitrate. They were in a, a regular warehouse that we store storage in, furniture, and I got them out and I reached out to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and I said, I have these films, I've got to, I want to preserve them. So I donated them um, to the, the Academy. They, they are taking, film by film, they've taken two, they've refurbished them. They're in a sealed um, temperature control vault and they'll be saved and preserved and can be seen there at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in Los Angeles. So that's the story behind those films. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, what's your name? Hi, my name is Noah. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, my question is, what does your research process look like for whether it be making meth, wielding the dark saber, or leading Vaught? What does the process look like of how you prepare for those? How bad did you mess up your Google algorithm about researching meth? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, totally, totally, totally. You know, um, I have a different process for everything I do, but it's basically along an outline of what I developed years ago. Um, and it's because of my interest and fascination with learning new things. Uh, for me, you know, you never get old if you're always curious. And I'm very curious specifically and especially about things I don't know or haven't been exposed to. Being an actor has really expanded my intellectual prowess about a lot of different things because I don't just walk and look at the words. That's what I have to say, that's sort of my roadmap, but then the roadmap gets deeper when you really want to find out about what a person, the character you're playing, what that character does. So um, I start slow, as I did years ago when I was on Broadway doing um, musicals and then doing plays. Um, uh, and it, 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 it 
extended itself to the, my work in television and in film to allow, because in, in a play, the playwright's word is everything. And I don't change a word because I want to know what the playwright's intention is. Intention in life is everything. If I'm an actor, I'm a channel for someone else's intention. So then I have to figure and look at what, what do you want to say? I was recently with Francis Ford Coppola and he speaks over a bullhorn, he's 83 years old, God bless him, and I gotta walk all the way to the back of the room because I don't want to communicate over, you know, publicly. And I want to go and be really clear about what he's asking for. So the point is, I stack up building blocks, just like learning lines. I get a certain piece of information, I put it here, that part of the brain. I get another piece of information, I put it back there. I, I take what is most pertinent for me to know now, and then I keep deeply expanding the knowledge of the character and what the character does. And I feel like that's my thorough process. Because I just feel like the gift to get the role is one thing. But the gift to extend my connecting my being to who the character is and what the character thinking is, is a whole other thing. And so it's extensive work that I do to feel fulfilled all on my own without even saying the lines. Um, so um, I, I love the process because I believe it's not about the destination. It's really about the journey. If I just tried to be a celebrity or a star, it might, could have all happened. But now that it's all come, that's not what's most important to me. What's most important is that I have the, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful every day. When I get up and look in the mirror, I'm thankful, oh, I have folks I can share some ideas with who might ask me questions, who I might have questions of them. I have work that fulfills me and extends me not only from my heart, but also from my brain. And so it's a wonderful thing when you're in that sharing. If you are in something that is not feeding your soul, your spirit, your intellect, but just giving you dollars, get out. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Thomas. Uh, it's awesome to meet you. Hey, Thomas. Um, my question is, what is a certain, is there a certain scene that you filmed that has like stuck with you that was really impactful to film? You know, I did a scene in a, in a movie that maybe no one here has seen called Go Tell It on the Mountain, um, a James Baldwin novel. I did this film probably 40 years ago. And it was, um, it was really about the church and the love affair uh, between a, a young man and a young girl um, in the church. It, it, it was about our African-American community. And there was a scene in there, uh, because I grew up in, with a mom who played piano in the church, um, where this young boy gets saved. And it was such an important scene to me because it was sort of like, for me, you know, I, I went to military school. I was an altar boy. I grew up in the Catholic church. Um, I, had, um, I have a spiritual life. Um, which is a spiritual discipline, which is connected to the voice I was speaking about earlier. The, in the, if you can't find the voice inside you, it takes time to do that. Sit quietly, find God or goddess. That's a representation uh, of something that is inspiring to you. But that is discipline, right? Reading the masters, whether they be yogi masters or Catholic masters or saints, um, they had a journey for a reason to inspire us how to live. Um, so for me, that's one scene, Go Tell on the Mountain. Um, but I have many scenes that have stuck with me from films I've done over the years that grew me, that took me from one place to another. After all, isn't that what I do? You know, acting is doing something real for a purpose, bringing, bringing people, who, the viewers, lifting them or taking them down <laughs> from one place to another, right? You're watching but you're on the journey with someone. And my job is to take you on the journey of that story. And, and so um, that was a really, really a great film for me and a great moment. Um, I did my own film. My first um, film was called Gospel Hill that I shot in, in Carolina. And, um, and I, my, the church scene in that movie with the RZA and me and, and uh, Taylor Kitsch and Danny Glover and Angela Bassett, um, sort of returned me to the inspiration of what I felt 
in um, in this James Baldwin novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain. What I realize is I've been given the gift of passion. And what I have to be compassionate about with many people that I meet and be out of judgment, judgment's the mind that says, oh, they don't like me. Oh, they're like this. Oh, they're like that. Struggle against and fight against that. But what I realize is that some people are dull to the world. They don't feel anything. Now, I don't know what that feels like. So I want to be compassionate and understanding of what that may feel like. I mean, God forbid for me um, that I didn't feel anything. So if you're walking through the motions and you want to feel something, you've got to become engaged emotionally with something. Right? Something, a passion, something you love. Your dream. How many people do you know had a dream? And their dream, they let it go. Didn't you want to do this? Didn't you want to do that? Well, I did, but you know, it, it just didn't happen for me. Or they, they, we all have our theys. I hate the theys. They wouldn't let me. They didn't hire me. They didn't see me, right? Your story, the story that you speak becomes your story. Her story, is the same. I'm telling you from my own experience, change your words and your story will change. Change your words. I always, oh, no. You always, no. No, no more. Because manifestation is real for us. Every one of you, you come here to manifest something, and I believe me, you're doing it. I look out there in the audience, and I see people who are dressed, people in wonder, joy, enchantment, excitement, passion. Right? Listen to yourself. That's what I mean. Just hear the words you use. I always, oh, no, 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 no. Sometimes I have done before. Today I'm not. Today I'm here. Today I'm bright. Today I'm going to pass on my spirit unconditionally. Right? Then your life changes. And believe me, try it, man. It's easy. Try it. It's great. Thank you so much. I'm having fun with you guys today. Y'all didn't know you were coming to church on Sunday, did you? <laughs> Hi, come on up. Hi, my name is Eliza. Was your Moth Gideon suit hot? <laughs> Elijah, nice to meet you. I played the character of Elijah in Go Tell on the Mountain. It could be, could not be more um, fantastic to have you step to the mic. Um, it, it was hot. Uh, it was a little bit constricting, so I had to figure out how to move. So my mother, who taught me voice, God rest her soul, when I did my first Broadway show, we do all these exercises. Me, me, ba, 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 ba. all these breathing exercises and move our face to get it loose and all that. Then she said, go on stage and forget about it. So I'm, I'm in, in front of the mirror with my whole costume on and I have to open the door because it is hot. But more than anything, I had to figure out how to move in that naturally because I couldn't have as much extension and, and everything I did. Uh, so yeah, it was hot. They had no fan. Mando had a fan in his helmet. bo -Katan had a fan in her helmet. I didn't have a helmet. I wanted a fan on my chest. Yeah, I was sweating, dude. <laughs> Thank you, Eliza. Good question. Thank you. Hi, step on up. Hello, my name is Fred, and I didn't have so much a question as I wanted to um, share my appreciation. One, in two different ways. One, for your character of Gus, as the queer people of color representation, that character is amazing. And we were falling out of Breaking Bad, and when Gus came to the scene, he just re brought us, engaged us, and brought us right back in. And this is an amazing character. And secondly, for Stan Edgar, the speech you gave about the rights of people of color to be able to make statements and our ability to behave the way we would like and respond the way we would like, being limited was really moving, and we really appreciate that, and I want to share that with my children, and I really thank you for doing that. Thank you, Fred. I really appreciate that. You know, part of, part of me, if you haven't already guessed, um, feels like you, when you get a little more mature in age, you, you sort of let go of things that you held, held on to for a long time. And um, I'm really blessed and, and happy for all the mentors I've had in my life, 
and for people like you who come and say the words you, you, you're saying to me now. Because I realize my journey, my mission is different than anyone else's. And, and because I can find the words to put together and put my ego space away, um, maybe only for a few seconds, but that's good enough to be able to share with all of you who I really am. Like it's an honor to be here, to be able to have this sharing and, and this fellowship um, so I can really hear your words. I've been able to express a lot about, of who I feel I am through the characters I play. And, and that's an outlet for expression. Like why are we really here? I don't, I don't care what you do, right? What, what's really key is that each of you in the audience, I mean each and every one of you, really gets that you are an original. Like there's some contribution that you've been put here or invited yourself here to share. And when you really understand the, the, the depth of that, right, it, it sometimes becomes a burden because that's a great responsibility. So I feel like, especially and specifically when I play a historical character like Adam Clayton Powell Jr. in Godfather of Harlem, which you must all see, that I have a responsibility to tell someone's story who lived and is now dead the way it was, to recreate that character as who he was, good, bad, ugly, all the different sides of him, and all the great things he did and all the horrible things he did, because that's his history, to be honest and truthful. It's taken me a long time to be honest and truthful with myself. And maybe having children has something to do with it. Maybe um, as I, I started, the more mature I get, the more truth I tell, because I don't have anything to prove anymore. And you know, so I can really look at and weigh on those scales who I didn't want to be as I came to be this. But I can let that go because I'm not that person I was yesterday. Why? Because I've been affected by all of you in separate interactions and relationships. I've been grown by someone stopping me, my children saying, Papa, that's, that's appropriation, you can't say that. That's you're making fun of. Well, yeah, then I could, I could say, well, I'm your father, and I can make fun of whoever I want because I'm an actor. That's no excuse, Papa, right? Our world is changing rapidly. To have respect and concern for others becomes more and more apparently important because that other that you don't know is the other that's gonna pull you out of the trench when it all goes awry. So the more we understand that we're all in this together, on some very visceral, spiritual, connected level, the more we'll be able to rise up and say, we're gonna take it back from government that doesn't listen to us. We're gonna take it back from politicians with two parties that say it's one or the other. We're gonna take it back and say, no, it's for the people, by the people. Who are the people? We are, we are. Thank you. Thank Hi. you, Fred. Step on up. Hello. Oh my goodness. This is a big moment. Mr. Okay. Esposito, thank you for everything you have done. Now, uh, speaking as a, a voice, a stage and film actor myself, uh, we spoke a lot today of passion. You're a very passionate individual. I share that passion. One of my greatest passions is food. And one of my favorite foods is fried chicken. My question to you, Mr. Gustavo Frink, have you eaten at or are you aware of Gus's world's famous fried chicken of Kansas City? I am aware of Gus's and I avoid them because Pollos Hermanos is the best. I assure you, sir, they are up to our point standards. Thank you. I'm very tempted to try Gus's. There's one in Austin. I know it's here in Kansas City. I may have to stop there on the way to the airport. <laughs> Hello, step on up. Hi, I'm Gavin. Uh, I loved you in Breaking Bad. Uh, what was your favorite moment uh, being a part of Breaking Bad? There's so many great moments that I experienced on that show. Certainly working with Brian Kemp Cranston was a really wonderful part of it, and Aaron Paul. But I loved 401 Box Cutter, directed by Vince Gilligan, because the first 10 minutes of that particular episode, I said nothing at all. And, and so it, it taught me to act in the silence, to act in between the words. What I realized from Breaking Bad was I could have a thought, it would grow. Again, what you think 
grows. What you do today determines your tomorrow. What you say is important. Words carry a weight. So for me to let all the words go and have an intentionality in my physicality in playing that scene um, to me was a wonderful thing. There are Pinter pauses I speak about in some articles I do. Uh, Harold Pinter was a great playwright and he wrote these long pauses. <laughs> Everything stops. But within that space, there's time to breathe. Within that space, there's time to hear. Within that space, it may seem suspended to you, but there's peace, a lot of peace. And so I love that particular episode because it, we get uncomfortable in their silence, especially in our world today. It's awkward, our whole lives are awkward. When anything awkward happens, we giggle awkwardly to fill the silence with more awkwardness. <laughs> I mean, why not just check it out? Like I'm checking you out, that smile on your face, right? I'm feeling your spirit. We don't feel each other's spirit anymore. I certainly feel not only the first row, I feel so much of your spirit in the time and space that we give to each other to be able to really listen, to hear. It's not only that we're listening to someone speak like you're listening to me, you're listening for the cues of spirit to be affected by another person. The rhythm of the universe. So I like that scene, 401, box cover, Breaking Bad. Thank you. I believe this will probably have to be our last question because no! we are running short. I know. No! I'm the bad guy. I know. Go ahead. What's your name? Uh, my name is Lake. I'm honored to be the last question. My first experience in seeing your acting was actually Payday 2. And I hope to see you in Payday 3. <laughs> um, let's say something happens in your life and parts of you, I guess you lose. Passion becomes a lot harder to feel. Passion becomes a lot harder to show. How do you recover from that? Great question. I'm glad you like Payday. What a great question. You made me first think of Kaleidoscope, a show I have on Netflix. I was, you know, thank you, a really great show that you should all see. You can watch it in any order you want. It's about a heist. So it's really entertaining and really great. I was doing a scene with the gal, Tati Gabrielle, who plays my daughter. And um, I disappeared from her life for many years, from the time she was 10 to the time she was an adult and I'm trying to get her back in a scene um, for a certain reason. I don't want to tell you too much about the show, but you should see it. And I realized in the conversation with her that, um, and you made me think of this, um, uh, when you said, um, if you lose everything. I've lost everything in my life. In the scene, I realized I didn't want to lose. And I, I, I stopped in the middle of the scene and said, you gotta lose this. You're not gonna win this. Lose this, become vulnerable. You left her. You gotta feel that to do the scene properly. Um, but your question is, what do you do if that happens? Well, you begin an introverted inside process. As, the, as your brain's a computer, it'll never turn off. You're gonna try to pick it apart, what happened? And then when you figure out what happened, you're still not satisfied because you're gonna wanna recover. The only recovery, as for me, when I got divorced and I went bankrupt and lost my house, I wound up living in a goat barn, I had no work, you know, all of that. Thought about taking my own life. I started to think, why am I here? When, how often do we ask the question, why am I here? And even more so, when are we patient enough to ask and wait for the answer? Right, that's the tricky part. So to rebuild, I can tell you what I did. I got quiet, I read some books, I sat in meditation every day. I developed um, a physical yoga practice that helped me go inside. I was bored as hell because sitting there for an hour listening to my breath going out of my body didn't seem like it was doing anything for me until it did. And then, I, then visions came to me, listening to the voice, and I started to develop my process. 
got a book rights, developed that into a story, saw a movie when I was a young boy, one of the rights to, took me 20 years, I finally got those rights, right? Again, what you do every day, even if it's 10 minutes a day, to cultivate something inside you, a dream, a wish, an idea, and then getting others to join you, right? Part of what you have to do is convince people that this is good, this is gonna help people, or it's just a great story, whatever it is. So, but to be really specific, you spend time with yourself in a quiet space. And then if you need help, you go get a psychiatrist. I did it, right? So we're proud people. I don't want help, I can do this. But you know what? They say today there's more mental illness in human beings who may be sharing it with others and tell, talking about it than ever. There's more, you know, um, numbing down our being with drugs and alcohol because we don't know how to go inside. And I'm not saying that's the only way, but I got on my knees and I prayed to God and Goddess to help me find the light again. And if you're not spiritual, not religious, sit quietly, listen to your breath, but you build, you rebuild. We are unbelievable as human beings. I lost my house, my cars, my motorcycle, my children for a while, my, my wife, and all of it. There was nothing else but me. And so the ego had to die too. And I had to, I couldn't talk about my bankruptcy, I couldn't talk about being broke, I couldn't talk about any of it because I was proud and I had shame. When you get rid of all that, you can start to rebuild. I need help. And you know what? The universe will answer you. Your friends will answer if they're really your friends. People will suggest. A guy gave me a book on what happened to my cheese. <laughs> I was bankrupt. The book was this thick, a thin book. I read it in an hour. And he gave me the book. His name is Dodge Bingham. I was living in Connecticut. I lost my house. He gave me this book. He says, this might help you. And I said, you give me a book about a mouse? trying to find the cheese. I'm depressed, I want to kill myself. My, I, I lost my house, my kids. And he said, just read the book, maybe it'll help. And it's about business, changing things. Change is good, it may be freaking all of us out when change happens and you determine that it's bad change because I can't feed my family, but that change really changes you. Because then you gotta do something. I need help. And that's all you gotta say. And I'm telling you, everything will conspire. <laughs> Angels will come, friends will come, parents will come. And it'll change your head, which will change how you think, you'll have hope again, and you'll start to build. Because you are a commodity. Each and every one of you are a commodity of light and love and brilliance with something to offer technologically, creatively, poetically, physically, mentally, intellectually. When you get in touch with the power that you have within, you will be unstoppable and you'll create a universe of humanity that will be unstoppable with you. And then we'll have no war, we'll have no ego, we'll have no rich or poor, because we will share all of what we have with each other. Ooh. Ladies and gentlemen, have you been inspired today? Oh! Please give a big round of applause to Giancarlo Esposito. I love you. I love you, Kansas City. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We did not get to your place, so be sure to stop by. You'll be signing autographs, photos, all of that. Please stop by and say hello. Hugs, whatever you need. I need a hug. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.